may not. Evan Weiner is an award-winning journalist who is among a very small number of people who cover the politics and business of sports and how that relationship affects not only sports fans, but the non-sports fans as well. Weiner began, began his journalism career while in high school at the age of 15 in 1971. He won two Associated Press Awards for radio news coverage in 1978 and 1979. He was presented with the United States Sports Academy first ever Distinguished Service Award for Journalism in 2003 in Mobile, Alabama, advisor to the SUNY Cortland Sports Business Management Program, the United States Sports Academy 2010 Ronald Reagan Media Award. He is also the author of seven books, and I won't list them, but he's been quoted in 25 other books and his words were read into the United States House of Representatives Congressional Record, July 14th, 2004, Subcommittee on Telecommunications and the Internet of the Committee on Energy and Commerce, House of Representatives, 108th Congress, second session. So I could go on and on, but I will <laughs> hand it over to you to uh, present to us the history of American golf in Westchester. Thank you, Giovanni, and thank you for inviting me again. I've spoken uh, in person at the library in the past, and uh, I normally like to do one-on-one, -on -one, or not one-on-one, -on -one, but I normally like to be uh, in person. Uh, Zoom is a great platform. It's a bit limiting for me because I do like to go off script. A lot. Well, actually, I don't have a script, but I do like to go off script. Uh, just a little background on me. I started in 1971. I was at Spring Valley High School, Rockland County, New York, technically Muncie, New York, although they called it Spring Valley High School. I was in 11th grade and a guy by the name of Joe Dionisio, who I still talk to all these years later. Uh, he's up in Orange County in New York right now, hoping to move to Florida or Arizona. And uh, he comes up to me, this is, I'm 15, this is September of 1971. He says, hey, student, and he's like this all the time, student, you got a good voice. How would you like to be a radio? And he doesn't know my name. He never knew my name, as a matter of fact. But on the other hand, um, he, uh, he said, you got a good voice. How would you like to be in radio? And I said, yeah, I want to be in radio. I want to be in radio in the worst way. Guess what? I was in radio in the worst way. I was on WRKL radio, uh, AM 910, 1,000 watt daytime only radio station in Rockland County in uptown and downtown Mount Ivy, which is on Route 202 near Pomona. And uh, the show was called Tiger Talk. It was a 15 minute, sh talk, a 15 minute show about uh, Spring Valley High School. It was horrible, but it was my beginning. Uh, about six and a half years later, um, I was working at WGRC Radio. That was in Nanuet, New York, 1300 on your dial, even smaller station, 500 watt station. And uh, my boss, Steve North, not much of a boss, he's two years older than me, uh, who he might, uh, Giovanna, you might have some of his work in your library because he helped ghostwrite Geraldo Rivera's books. Uh, but anyway, he says, you got to go out and you got to go cover uh, a thing on Saturday. The uh, New York State Democrats are having a fundraiser and uh, don't worry, it's Saturday, just have something for Monday morning. So I go down to the Tappan Zee townhouse in those days in Nyack and I'm looking around and I'm looking around, looking for a story. And the first guy that walks in is an uh, assemblyman by the name of Gerald Nadler. I don't know if you ever heard of Gerald Nadler or not. Uh, I think he did something earlier this year. Uh, then came in Mario Cuomo with Matilda and Andrew and a precocious little kid named Chris Cuomo. Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan had come in. And then there was this tall guy, tall guy, sandy blonde, grayish hair, really good looking. And you couldn't miss him. I mean, as a guy, I could tell you, he was really good looking. He walked right up to me. I knew who he was because I watched Batman. He was Mayor Lindsay of Gotham City. And he looks at me and he never introduces himself to me. He says, I want to tell you something. And he puts his arm around my shoulder. He said, I like you. I'm going to tell you this. And uh, I don't know what he's going to tell me. He said, well, I said, yeah, well, what are you going to tell me? I'm going to run for Senate, state of New York. Got my story. My first ever scoop. I got my story. And then uh, I walk uh, 
walk out of there. I don't need anything else. I got the big story of the day. So I go back to my 500 watt radio station, which was in the trailer. And uh, I do the report for us because it's immediate. I call AP, Marlene Egg over to Associated Press. She put, uh, puts it out. Then I got a call from uh, UPI, United Press International, Randy Brulage. He puts it out. And then I get a call from Henry Marcotte at WNEW Radio. And some of the older folks here, uh, WNEW uh, New York, you might remember them, William B. Williams and the Sinatra and chairman of the board and all that. And they said, uh, how would you like to do that story for us? Can we buy that tape? And I said, how much are you paying me? It's 10 bucks. That was Henry Marcotte. And I said, Henry, it's sold for 10 bucks. And I started a three and a half year career doing some work for WNEW. Um, and that's my story through the age of 24 years old. Golf, golf starts in Westchester County, New York in the United States. And golf really is the playground of the rich in Westchester County, the Gilded Age, uh, the Carnegies, uh, the Vanderbilts. They wanna have a good time and they find a lot of farmland that they could find a good time in Westchester County because you need farmland, convert it into a golf course, and have some fun. But golf, we don't really know where it started from. We have no idea where golf started from. Uh, but we do know in the United States, and that's an old picture because that sign has chipped away and you can still read the letters, but it needs a good paint job. The first golf course in the United States, 1888. And that was on North Broadway in Yonkers, right off the Hudson River, uh, a couple feet away from where um, the mansions are over in uh, Yonkers, the old mansions, which are now museums. The first green of the original six hole course established by St. Andrews, 90 feet east. Actually, it wasn't the first golf, well, that was the first golf course, but it wasn't the first time that golf was played in Yonkers. Meanwhile, we have no record as how golf began, Maybe the Romans played it, we don't know. Maybe the Chinese played it, we don't know. But we do know that the first written record of golf is James II banning golf in Scotland in 1457. Why? Hey, what would you rather do, go golfing or learn archery? So he decides, you know what, we've got to get rid of this golf thing because it's interfering with archery and it probably interfered with soldiers and archery in those days. So we've got to get rid of it. But James II had a, a grand, well, you know, generational gap here, I think. Uh, he had a grandson that just didn't, didn't, didn't listen to him. There, of course, is Scotland. I was in Scotland in the year uh, 2014, the Scottish flag. Uh, we do know that uh, golf originated in the 15th century in Scotland. James IV decided that he needed to play golf. He wanted to play golf. And uh, he decided, you know what? I don't care what my grandfather said. I am playing golf. Uh, so in the 15th century in Scotland, the 18-hole uh, course was created at the, at the old course at St. Andrews in 1746. Golf's first major in the world's oldest tournament the Open uh, was played for the first time in 1860. It's known as the Open, but people call it the British Open in Ayrshire, Scotland. And there's James IV. James IV was a golfer. Must have really disappointed his grandfather. His grandfather must have been really upset. But anyway, James IV decided that golf was a good thing for Scotland. And all these centuries later, it remains a good thing for Scotland. James IV lifted the ban in 1502 when he became a golfer. Now, hey, look, listen, this guy's the king, right? He had his own golf balls, his own golf clubs by 1503 or 1504 for golf, for golf cubbies and balls to the king that he played it with. Did I say that right, David? David Webb, uh, is my accent good enough? <laughs> Um, yeah, I can't hear what he's saying, so, uh, but uh, Daniel's iPad, you can open that up for a second. He's giving me the thumbs up. Uh, well, every person I've known from Scotland can barely understand what they say, but anyway, uh, he played golf. Golf is documented as being played at the Musselburgh Links, East Lothingham, Scotland, as early as March 2nd, 1672, according to the Guinness World Records, Musselburgh. 
uh, is the Lynx. That's the oldest golf course in the world. Hey, look at her. Looks like the same painter did that. Anyway, Mary, Queen of Scots. She may have been the first duffer. She may have a first female duffer. Mary, Queen of Scots, played golf here. I guess the family liked playing golf. She reputedly played it there in uh, 1567. Uh, the first account of uh, what happened at golf one day, and I can't figure out the scoring, was by John Forless of Ravelston. His entry into his diary, 2 March 1672, for three golf balls, zero, 152-0. Apparently, he lost the golf. I can't make heads or tails out of it. And for most people, they couldn't make heads or tails out of golf scores until the 1950s when the Ayatollah came around, Frank Cherkadian. Hey, the McDonald boys, they played golf too. That's a famous painting. And um, you know, McDonald boys went out and played golf. That golf club looks a little big. And that other golf club looks more like a rifle if you look at it. But they played golf. Uh, the oldest surviving rules of golf were compiled in March of 1744 for the company of gentlemen golfers. Golfers, they're always gentlemen, right? They're always gentlemen. Later renamed the Honorable Company of Edinburgh Golfers. And that was played at Leith in Scotland. Now, the Open, which was scheduled to be played in July, which is not going to be played this year because of the... Uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, virus or uh, and pandemic, the world's oldest golf tournament in existence and golf's first major is the Open Championship. It was played on October 17, 1860 at Prestwick Golf Club in uh, Ayrshire, Scotland with Scottish golfers uh, winning the earliest majors. Welcome to Westchester and that is Wingfoot. That is my son in 1994 at the Wingfoot Country Club over, uh, I guess it's Mamaronex, New Rochelle, and uh, that is where the uh, 2020 uh, U.S. Open is scheduled to be played in September. It was supposed to start next week, and uh, it's not a very far ride from Westchester or from the uh, Yonkers to the golf course over uh, in Mamaronex. Uh, in 1888, there were two Scotsmen from Dunfermline. from Milne. Uh, John Reed and Robert Lockhart, and they set up a hole in an orchard. Uh, Reed took some friends to a cow pasture on Lake Avenue. It was a warm Washington birthday, February 22nd, 1888. Of course, it's not Washington's birthday anymore. It's President's Weekend. Lockhart brought some hickory shaft clubs and good of percher balls back from a business trip to Scotland. He decided he wanted to play golf. It must have been a really nice February day. And with John Upton, they're in this patch and they decide, hey, we got three, we could improvise three holes. And with that, Westchester County becomes the home of golf. The first place golf is played in the United States is in Yonkers, right across from the Hudson River. And that was over on Lake Avenue by North Broadway. But as things, as things evolve, they can't go golfing in March. Why? Well, there's a slight little thing called the blizzard of 1888. Now, that strikes on March 11th. Uh, it's one of the biggest blizzards in American history in the Northeast. It killed as many as 400 people, 55 inches of snow on the ground. And, uh, and that was in New York City. And of course, Yonkers is the next town up from New York City. Uh, and they couldn't play. They just couldn't play. But the snow would eventually thaw and would melt. And eventually, Reed and Lockhart would go to a 30-acre meadow, which was owned by the neighborhood butcher, John Schatz, uh, at North Broadway in Shotton Place, across from uh, the St. Michael's Ukrainian Church. There they lay out a six-hole course. And in 1888, it's golf that uh, begins in the United States over in Yonkers. Now, what these guys didn't know was pretty soon that the Gilded Age people, the Vanderbilts and the uh, Goulds and all the rest of them, uh, Anderson Cooper's family uh, as well, uh, which would be the Vanderbilts and the Carnegie's, would also want to join them 
to play golf. On November 14, 1888, Reed decided, hey, let's get this club formally organized. The officials were elected, Reed became president, more equipment was imported from Scotland, and by the spring of 1889, there were 12 members of this golf course called St. Andrews in Yonkers. Now, if you know anything about uh, St. Andrews today, it's no longer in Yonkers, it's on Jackson Avenue. Uh, when you come up the sprain or come down the sprain, you get off Jackson Avenue, you're coming north, you make a left, you're coming south, you make a right, you go up to the next right, you go on that little side road, and there it is right in front of you, St. Andrews Golf Course. But the original St. Andrews was in Yonkers. Uh, they moved it to Palisades Avenue in 1892 to another apple orchard complete with an apple tree next to the first tee. So I guess it was a good thing Sir Isaac Newton wasn't there because the apple might have fallen on his head there while they played golf. Uh, and that is what golf looked like in 1894. People came dressed up in their finest clothes um, with ties or bow ties, with vests, smoking pipes, uh, with hats. And that is what uh, Yonkers and Westchester looked like in 1894. Now, uh, the Gray Oaks Club on, Sour Mill, on the Sour Mill River was a nine-hole course, and the first amateur golf championship was held in Yonkers on, uh, in October of 1894, and L.B. Stoddard of the St. Andrews course defeated Charles B. McDonald of Chicago. But see, McDonald was kind of a sore loser. He wasn't thrilled by any of this, and he complained that it really wasn't a championship because there was no national organization. It was just these local guys from Yonkers putting on something. So it really didn't count. He was the runner up, but this doesn't count. He's a sore loser. McDonald would eventually come back to Westchester. And there he is, as Charles McDonald. Now, St. Andrew's secretary and founding member, Henry Talmadge, invited the representatives of now four leading golf courses in the United States, the Chicago Golf Club, Shinnecock out in Long Island, uh, out in the Hamptons, Newport, home of the Newport Jazz Festival. Notice these are all high, high-end places where the golf courses are being laid out, except for Yonkers. And the Country Club of Brookline, Massachusetts, which was the home to Joe Kennedy eventually to a dinner at the Kelman Club in New York. And it is at that club that they decided, hey, you know what? Why don't we make McDonald happy? We're going to have a National Golf Association. So the United States Golf Association is formed. Talmadge is its first secretary. McDonald is elected vice president. The first USGA sanctioned U.S. Amateur Championship would be held at the Newport Country Club in Rhode Island. And McDonald could raise the mug and be really happy because he won. It didn't matter what, whether it's the same people or not that he lost the year before, but he won because it was a national, uh, national club. Uh, again, notice it was in Newport, uh, which again, the playground of the rich, Newport at that point. Now, if you were in New York City and you were a commoner, well, if you ever take the four train over on Jerome Avenue, in Van Cortlandt Park, there's still a golf course. That is the golf course that was built for the commoners because golf was becoming popular in the gay 90s, in the 1890s. So you were able to, uh, for your 25 cents, for your two bits, get out on the golf course, which was at the end of the four train eventually, and play golf in the Bronx of Van Cortlandt Park. Van Cortlandt Park opened July 6th, 1895. The popularity of the sport had been steadily, had steadily grown after that for decades. Uh, that course came about when a local group of businessmen in Riverdale were looking for private lands within New York City to buy, to build a golf course. And the city came around and said, okay, here's some land. And uh, they got their first appointed golf course in the Bronx. The private clubs were the big thing. The private clubs as in Yonkers, and there were two caddies there with the rich people. Uh, in 1897, the St. Andrews Club purchased new property at Mount Hope off Jackson Avenue, built the 18-hole course. 
The members included at the time, people you know, Andrew Carnegie, USS Steel, Stanford White, the architect. Stanford White was killed in, in a very strange way, and it's become legendary television shows later on. That's how he was killed. He also, uh, he was an architect who, among other things, uh, the second Madison Square Garden uh, was his that he designed. In 1983, Jack Nicholas redesigned the golf course. Uh, I was up there when uh, he re redesigned it. Uh, for his news conference and uh, how he was talking he had to preserve the past, but look at the future up there. There is Carnegie in 1899, and that is him on Jackson Avenue or right off of Jackson Avenue. And why were people like Carnegie up there? Why were they in Westchester? Why weren't they, they elsewhere? Well, simple. So the railroads, Metro North. Metro North was able to get to the west side, to Yonkers. They were able to go right up uh, the center of Westchester and also New Haven line. So these guys were looking for property. Uh, there was the old putt line, uh, which is now uh, no longer a line, which is now a bicycle path uh, on the west side. So they were able to get out of New York City, this is prior to cars, taking the train up to somewhere in Westchester. And that's why Westchester ended up with so many golf courses because they didn't want to cross the river into New Jersey and Long Island was still quite a hike. Westchester was rather convenient. So all the Gilded Age guys would come up there. Women were not welcomed. This was a man's thing and women were not welcomed. Even the women of the wives of the Gilded Age people. No, nah, they weren't welcome. So you know what the women did? And this was in sheer defiance of their husbands, in sheer defiance of the time, the 1890s. Uh, there was no such thing as women's liberation at that point. Women were still looking for the right to vote, but they were also, at least the rich women, were looking for the right to play golf. And they decided, aha, I'm gonna show you. John Reed's wife, Elizabeth, and several other of the St. Andrew's women decided we're gonna play golf we don't care what you think. And they leased some land on North Broadway and established the Sag Hill Country Club. And uh, it soon became the most popular country club in Westchester and would move to a site overlooking the Hudson River in 1869. And they had 100 members and they were mostly women, but they were also common men. And the common men wanted to play golf on Sundays. There were blue laws in Westchester on Sundays. You couldn't do anything. Stores have to be closed. The baseball players who were interested in playing baseball on Sunday, they couldn't do it. The golfers couldn't do it. But these women said, no, 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 no. We are going to play golf on Sunday. And because they decided to play golf on Sunday, which is really defiant when you think of women back in those days, um, you know, that wasn't something that women did. But these women were defiant. And there's the club that they built, and they decided you could play golf with us on Sundays. Well, there was a problem in, uh, in the 1890s. The men decided to play golf. They were on the golf course, and guess what? They were arrested for breaking the law. The men were bre breaking the law. In a courtroom crowded with prominent residents of this place, the question as to the right of man, the right of man, not women. Women own this, women own this course, but it was the right of men to play golf on Sunday in Yonkers was decided here today by the discharge of Benjamin Adams. Mr. Adams was arrested last Sunday for playing the game on the links of, of the Sag Hill Golf Club. He was tried before Judge Kellogg in a jury of six and was discharged, but only after a hard-fought legal battle, during which there was an angry exchange of words by Judge Kellogg and Joseph F. Daly, one of the attorneys for the defendant. The decision was received joylessly, joyously, probably joylessly too by some people, joylessly, uh, joyously by those who played baseball and the members of the Sag Hill Golf Club, of which the defendant is a member. It's because of the women, the wives of the Gilded Age people, that there were no laws anymore 
in Westchester County as of 1896, 1897. We never learned that in school. The jurors congratulated their decision and attorney and judge have a warm tilt. All of a sudden, you could play golf, you could play baseball, you could even go shopping on Sundays in Westchester, thanks to a bunch of women who decided, I want to play golf, I don't care what my husbands think. And there is Cornelius Vanderbilt, um, Anderson Cooper's uh, of CNN, uh, his, I'm not sure if his great-grandfather, or maybe his great-grandfather, the Ardsley Country Club. Women were allowed to all of a sudden play golf and play golf on a high level. The Ardsley Country Club hosted the third U.S. Open Amateur in 1898. Now, the people who are behind the uh, Ardsley Club, Jay Gould, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Jay, P. Port, uh, Jay Pierpoint Morgan, now it's called uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, William Rockefeller, and other notables of the Gilded Age. And they established the club in 1895 on the banks of the Hudson River as the Ardsley Casino. Now, McDonald, uh, McDonald found something else to do. Uh, there was a World's Fair in Chicago in 1892. And as part of the World's Fair, they asked McDonald, uh, the people behind the World's Fair in Chicago, to lay out a seven-hole golf course. Uh, the short course's popularity was high. And uh, in another couple of years, he was able to design two more uh, golf courses, one in uh, Wheaton, Illinois, that became the Chicago Golf Club. They were the first 18-hole golf courses in the United States. There is John D. Rockefeller. And uh, some of the names that you may recognize, the Bouviers. This is where I ask people, who are the Bouviers? And I always get an answer from somebody in the crowd. That was Jackie's father. Yes, that was Jacqueline Kennedy's father, right? The Bouviers lived in uh, Bronxville, along with the Kennedy family. Uh, right, right behind me, that way, going that way, nine-tenths of a mile north of me. Uh, so the Bouviers. Uh, the Rockefellers, uh, in fact, the Kennedy co compound back there is eight tenths of a mile from where I'm sitting right now. The Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, early members uh, in the early days of the Knollwood course. Legend had it that Bobby Jones met with a club member, Clifford Roberts, up in Tarrytown to discuss the creation of the Masters Tournament in Augusta, which became the Augusta National in the uh, Knollwood Grill Room up on Route 119 in Terrytown. History for golf is Westchester. It is Westchester. Uh, the Bedford Tennis Club added golf in 1896. The Scarsdale Golf Club opened in 1898. The Wacabuck Club in 1912. Blindbrook uh, in 1915. And uh, there are clubs near the library, as uh, Giovanna could tell you. Um, and all up and down Hutchinson River Parkway. Gene Sarazen. You ever do anything with Gene Sarazen in the Harrison Library? Giovanna, ever do anything about him? Gene Harrison was from Harrison, Harrison, New York. He was born in uh, 1910 in Harrison, uh, 1902 rather in Harrison. Uh, he was born Eugenio Saracini in Harrison, New York. His parents were poor Sicilian immigrants. He began caddying around Westchester at the age of 12, took up golf himself, he developed his skills to become one of the greatest golfers ever, taught himself how to play. He was a little guy, uh, you know, 10, 11 years old, running around and uh, learned how to play as he was caddying. Uh, he is probably Westchester's all-time golfer. He would win 39 PGA tournaments. He would be inducted into the uh, World Golf Hall of Fame in 1974. He was the Associated Press Male Athlete of the Year in 1932, won the uh, PGA, Professional Golf Association's Tours First Lifetime Achievement Award in 1996 all because Westchester was the hub of golf. It was uh, in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. Sarazen in the 1920s would have many battles with Walter Hagen. Sarazen, Bobby Jones, and Hagen were the world's dominant players in the 1920s. They were all amateurs. 
you were looked down upon if you were a professional golfer at that time. These guys were all amateurs. They were held to a higher standard. Their rivalries expanded interest in golf around the world during the period, made the United States the world's dominant golf power for the first time, taking over this position from Great Britain and Scotland. Wingfoot, that was the uh, logo of the 2006 U.S. Open at Wingfoot uh, 14 years ago. Uh, Wingfoot. Wingfoot, which is where the U.S. golf, uh, the, where it will be played, the U.S. Open will be played in a couple in a couple months, has hosted five U.S. Opens, 1940 U.S. Championship, 1949 Walker Cup, the Walker Cup, Herb Walker, Herbert Walker, uh, George H.W. Bush's um, uncle, Herbert uh, Walker, also part owner of the New York Mets in the 1960s, and the PGA Championship on the West Course, the U.S. Open is going to be played there this year. Uh, the East Course has been the site of two U.S. Women's Open and the inaugural U.S. Uh, Seniors Open. Uh, in 2004, the U.S. Amateur Open was played uh, over the two courses over in, uh, in Mamaroneck off of Mamaroneck Road. Now, I was in Atlanta five years ago, and one of the things that you should do if you ever visit Atlanta is uh, go to the Oakland or the Oakwood uh, Cemetery. And they have all kinds of interesting people buried in this particular cemetery. One of them is Bobby Jones. And the thing that caught me about the grave here is the number of golf balls that are in front of the, of the grave. And also, if you could see on the left side, there's a little T over here uh, and where the little piece of paper is. And uh, people bring their putters to the cemetery and basically ask, what's my form? Not that the stone's going to talk back to them, but that's uh, one Sunday afternoon, a bunch of golf balls that are lying there because uh, a whole bunch of people decided they wanted Bobby Jones to check out their form as they were putting against his gravestone. But Bobby Jones, well, legend has it that uh, the Masters started in Westchester on what is now Ontario Town Road. Uh, the PGA held its first championship at the Swanu, uh, Swano uh, Country Club, which was founded in Mount Vernon by a bunch of golfers. They would move to another location in Mount Vernon and then end up in Bronxville, uh, right up the road from me, not very far. I could walk there and be there in 15 minutes. In 1913, Donald Ross designed that 18-hole course that saw Long Jim Barnes win the first PGA Championship in a final match over Jock Hutchinson in 1916. And that's the 100th anniversary uh, of that event. CBS sent people up to Bronxville to check out the course, to look at the history of that particular golf course. Uh, the Quaker Ridge Golf Club in Scarsdale. Any of you play there? Uh, it's right nearby Harrison. Uh, A.W. Tilkast uh, commission, was commissioned to build it in 1916. And this was a property that uh, was once held by the British Army. That's where the British Army camped in 1776 before defeating George Washington in the Battle of White Plains. And I guess uh, we're coming up to uh, an anniversary of the Battle of White Plains. Washington lost that one. Washington lost a lot of battles, but he prevailed and would win eventually. That club was opened in 1918, and it became the home course of people like Louis Gimble. I don't know how many people remember Gimbles anymore. Samuel Bloomingdale's. Bloomingdale's is still around. They're still in White Plains, and uh, some obscure musician, uh, piano player by the name of George Gershwin, who had his first hit uh, at that point, uh, something called Swanee. That El, somebody named Al Jolson did that. I don't know whatever happened to Gershwin or, or Jolson. I, I guess they, they were successful in their chosen field. Now, McDonald did come back again to Westchester. In uh, 1911, he uh, and his engineer, Seth Rayner, uh, oversaw the construction of the initial nine holes of what would become the Sleepy Hollow Country Club. Now, check out the board of directors uh, in 1911. John Jacob Astor IV, Cornelius Vanderbilt III, Edward Julius Bernwin, and a bunch of others. These were the rich people. Some of them, maybe robber barons. I got to go to the library and 
maybe Giovanna could help me out and find books on robber barons so I could check out whether any of those people were robber barons. Anybody have any clue whether they were robber barons or not? But anyway, that was the cream of the cream of New York society. And even though they could have cars and had cars by that point, they could still take the um, what is now Metro North to Sleepy Hollow, get right off there and go to the country club. The amateur game against the pro game. The amateur game, much popular. Bobby Jones, probably the greatest amateur. He won five amateur championships between 1924 and 1930. Jones won five of them during that time. In 1930, Jones won the US Open, the British Open, the US Amateur Championship, and the British Amateur Championship. During the first half of the 20th century, the idea of professional golf was looked down upon. You, and baseball players were looked down upon. Pro athletes were looked down upon during those days. They, they, were, they weren't people you wanted to hang out with. It wouldn't be until the 1940s and 50s that professional golf was taken seriously. During the 1930s, playing on the amateur circuit meant you were playing at the top of the sport, but there was no money in being an amateur, and Bobby Jones knew it. Uh, Bobby Jones quits in 1930. Um, an Associated Press story from the time noted that he was interested in starting his own private golf club. He wanted to start his own private club, and he was making instructional films for Warner Brothers. Now, Jack Warner, the whole Warner Brothers, I could tell you one thing about me and Warner Brothers. I could identify a Warner Brothers comedy just by the music that's played in there. And everything, I think everything, virtually everything I learned in life was from a Bugs Bunny cartoon. I know the dialogue of all Bugs Bunny and Warner Brother cartoons. And I bring that up because the Warner Brothers lived right behind me, kind of on the 90, uh, on a 45 degree angle in Mount Vernon, up on California Road. Bobby Jones played a lot of golf in Westchester in the 1920s. And there, there's no way he could not run into Jack Warner or the other Warner Brothers. So he probably met them, and he ends up making money, making instructional golf films for the Warner Brothers, complete with sound effects and all. Uh, Jones decides he's going to build his first golf course in Augusta, Georgia. The course would open in 1933. The first Masters takes place in 1934. If you remember, it was Bobby Jones along with Clifford Roberts, who first discussed having a master's type tournament in one of the restaurants at the Knollwood Country Club on Route 119. Horton Smith would win the first one. He did get a $1,500 prize. The tournament was held on radio. I've done radio broadcasts back in the 1980s of golf on radio. There is nothing more boring. But in 1934, it was a big deal because it brought golf into your home. It was a four-day event. Most golf tournaments, three-day events. Ushers in a whole new era of golf. And there is Bobby Jones in 1934 playing in Augusta. And of course, that is the most famous golf tournament now in the United States. Its roots, Westchester County. Jones wanted to bring the US Open to the course, uh, but it almost didn't happen for a number of reasons. Um, so they decided, yeah, you know what? If you don't want to give us the US Open, we'll have our own tournament. That became the Masters. It worked, changed the sport. That's the babe. Babe Mildred, uh, babe Mildred Dickerson as a Harrius. Uh, she, required, uh, she acquired her nickname during Sandlot baseball games with neighborhood boys. She's the greatest female athlete of all times. They thought she batted like Babe Ruth. She was a talented basketball player in high school. She was recruited her senior year to do office work at the Employees Casualty Company of Dallas. Oh, and by the way, while you're working, you're gonna play on our semi-professional basketball team. We're not gonna pay you for that. That's part of your job, the Golden Cyclones. Between 1930 and 1932, she led the team to two finals and national championship. She was All-American each season. The 1932 AAU, Amateur Athletic Union Championship, she placed in seven events, taking first place in five. Shot put, javelin, baseball throws, 85-meter hurdles, long jump. She tied for first in the high jump. 
finish fourth in the discus throw. She wasn't done yet. Her performances in the javelin throw and the hurdles and the high jump qualified her to enter the Los Angeles 1932 Olympics, and she got three world records in all three events. She won the gold medals for the javelin hurdles, and despite clearing the same height as the top finisher in the high jump, she was awarded the silver medal because she won over the bar head first. Those days, you couldn't do it. They would eventually change the rule. She decides to take up golf. And you know, the people in the golf circles, you know, they're still upper crust people, don't like it a bit. The Fort Worth Invitational, November 1932. Second one, the Texas Women's Amateur Championship. The following April, she captures the title. And the complaints come from the more socially polished members of the West Texas Women's Golf Association. And they ask the United States Association to rule her ineligible to compete as an amateur. She was an amateur golfer. She wasn't an amateur in other sports, but she was an amateur golfer. She uh, regained her amateur status in 1943. She would go on to win 17 consecutive tournaments. The British Women's Amateur Championship. She was the first American to win it. She would turn pro in 1947. And she was a pioneer. She was a women's lib pioneer, even before Billie Jean King. Babe was before Billie Jean King and Athea Gibson and others. Um, uh, she helped found the Ladies Professional Golf Association because she wanted to help a handful of professional women golfers get some money and get a tournament together. She was the LPGA's leading money winner between 1946 and 1951. She got cancer, ultimately would succumb. Uh, but uh, she's kind of forgotten now. She was the Associated Press uh, Athlete of the First Half Century uh, for women, 1950, uh, 1900 to 1950. Uh, and she did a lot of positive things to put forth women's sports. Not remembered very well today. Hollywood has always had a fascination with golf. Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Crosby more so than Hope. Hope played a lot of golf, but Crosby was really into it. The Bing Crosby clam bake started in 1937. After World War II, it became the Bing Crosby, Bing Crosby Celebrity Pro-Am and became one of the PGA Tour's most popular events. By 1960, the Thunderbird International had become the Palm Springs Desert Classic, but it just wasn't the same as Bing, because Bing would bring all the Hollywood people up there, and Bing lived up there, uh, and all the celebrities came up there to play. Um, the organizers, they wanted Bob Hope, but Bob Hope wasn't too keen on doing this, except he had a car sponsor for his TV shows, and Chrysler. Chrysler decided, hey, Bob, you know what? You like golf. Why don't you get involved? We'll sponsor this thing. It's good for you. It's good for us. It's good for golf. Why don't you do it? So rather reluctantly, Bob Hope, who at this time was losing favor with younger people, and, and that's a story unto itself, totally unto itself, which I'm not going to get into. But Bob Hope decides, yeah, I'll play golf. And yeah, I'll sponsor this thing. And he was a sponsor. He, was there until he really got sick at the end. He was about 101 years old at that time. Ben Hogan, one of the great golfers of all time. Uh, ben Hogan won the money title five times in his career, won the four U.S. Open titles, the Masters twice, the PGA twice, a single British Open, 1953. Hogan won the Masters, U.S. Open, and British Open all in the same year. Byron Nelson was a great golfer. Uh, 1945, he had his greatest season. He won 10 events, uh, rather uh, 10 events in a row. Uh, 18 altogether, he became the first player to top $50,000 in winning in a single year, getting $43,000 in 1945. And it was okay to become a professional by this time. Golf would change in the 1950s. And uh, these two guys, one of them still resonates. The other guy is in the history books. You could still buy iced tea. 
Arnold Palmer's iced tea. I guarantee you 90% of the people who buy the iced tea have no idea who Arnold Palmer is, just no idea. And, I, and Ike Eisenhower, uh, he was a president uh, from 1953 to 1961. So that's 67 years ago. And not too many people remember Ike as president or saying, I like Ike. I like golf. Uh, in 1953, ABC TV in the United States, the first golf tournament was broadcast nationally. That was outside of Chicago. The tournament was the World Championship of Golf, and that was uh, shown for an hour on the weekends uh, by ABC TV, which only had 14 stations at that point, so not too many people saw it. But Arnold Palmer, Arnold Palmer is coming onto the scene. Deacon Palmer was the professional at the nine hole Latrobe CC outside of Pittsburgh and the Palmer family lived on the golf course. Arnie dreamed of playing golf for a living. And by 1954, he would win uh, the US Amateur Tournament and would launch his career by winning that tournament in 1954. Now, David Webb is going to appreciate this because David is in the business. That is Frank Charkanian. And Frank Charkanian's nickname was the Ayatollah. Now, I'm sure a lot of people in here remember the Ayatollah Khomeini. And let me give you the background on this. Frank Charkanian was a director producer at CBS television starting in the 1950s. And he ran the uh, productions with an iron fist. And he knew what he was doing. And about 1979, 1980, actually, Pat Summerall is doing uh, tennis, actually. Uh, the CBS was doing the US uh, Open, the tennis Open, which uh, was in Flushing Meadow. And somebody said to Summerall, uh, well, what are you doing today? He said, I don't know, ask the Ayatollah. And with that, the nickname stuck. Frank Charkanian is probably more responsible for the popularity of golf among the generation who likes golf than anybody else. All he is is a television director. You wouldn't think a television director would be responsible for the popularity of tennis, but it is Charkanian, or rather golf, sorry about that, golf. It is Charkanian, it is Arnold Palmer, and it is Mike McCormick that makes golf what it is today. The Ayatollah. Now again, David, you're gonna appreciate this from the TV perspective and everybody else, people know, people have told me who have watched golf and asked me, well, what do I talk about on that? People know there is a very distinct sound from a golf tournament. It is the ball hitting the cup and making that noise, which is a signature noise unique only to golf. And it was Frank Cherkanian, the CBS director, who decided, I have this game in front of me, I have this product, I'm gonna play around with it, and he does. Frank introduces a high angle camera, which gives you new angles. He puts roving reporters on the ground going from hole to hole, and he made sure to capture the unique blend of sounds, the cup hitting the ball, the ball falling into the cup, which becomes to define the modern golf coverage. Also, when people tee off, you hear the club hitting the ball and the, and the whoosh sound that comes off the ball, which made people at home think, hey, I'm right there. I'm listening to these sounds. These are sounds of the golf cor course. He changed the way the scores were delivered. He said, I can't use this here. I, people don't understand. This guy's got this. This guy's got that. We're going to make it par. And this is gonna be the par for the 18 holes or the hole. You gotta make so many shots to get into the hole. If it's a par four, you do it in three, you're one under. It made people understand it. They understood a baseball score. They understood a football score at that point. They never understood a golf score. So Frank Cherkanian, the television director, Cherkanian, the television director, changes how golf is viewed absolutely changes it. And this is without even, with nobody, not even working with any stars. This is what his imprint is, and then he gets the stars. By the way, Frank is a member of the World Golf Hall of Fame, all because he decided to capture the sounds of the golf course, the ball hitting the cup, coming off of the tee. 
And here's another guy. This is all coming together at the same time in the late 1950s. Arnold Palmer, Coast Guard, Coast Guard guy. And uh, he would have Arnie's army. Uh, near Augusta National was Fort Gordon, which was a basic training camp where the master's chairman, Clifford Roberts, who happened to have lunch with Bobby Jones back in Westchester in the 1920s, was once stationed as a soldier. The master's golf tournament would need volunteers to work scoreboards. So he would go to Fort Gordon. Hey, want some free passes to come see the golf? Here, here they are. Uh, and some of you, you can work the scoreboards. That worked. And with that, the GIs became Palmer's big fans because they knew that he was one of them because he was in the Coast Guard. And they knew he was a guy. He played golf like a military man who played the sport like he was leading a battlefield charge. He treated Par as the enemy, the line, which Chicanian invented, that needed to be broken. The soldiers came out to watch their man at Augusta on the back nine, a GI working one of the scoreboards. Notice all the fans were in uniform. He made a small sign. He held it up. Arnie's Army. With that, Arnie's Army is born. And Arnie's Army becomes a signature event at every golf tournament that Frank is directing. So he's got Arnie. He's got the army, and he basically invents how you watch golf on TV. And there's the third piece of the puzzle here, Mark McCormick. Mark McCormick was a golfer who had met Arnold Palmer when they were both in college uh, back in the 1950s. And uh, McCormick was to become a sports agent. But before he became a sports agent of Arnold Palmer, he decided he was going to study Yogi Berra. Why Yogi Berra? Because in the 1950s, Yogi is getting all of these endorsements. Why is Yogi getting an endorsement? All these endorsements? Because Frank Scott, the former traveling secretary of the New York Yankees, became Yogi's agent and was able to leverage Yogi into all kinds of deals, selling batteries, selling bicycles, uh, um, selling all kinds of stuff uh, during the 1950s and showing up on the Bilko show and other places. So McCormick decides he's studying Frank Scott. He goes to Palmer and he says, I want to be your agent. They have a handshake agreement. Palmer becomes McCormick's first agent, struck with a handshake. He launches the idea of the athlete as a global brand. Well, he doesn't really do that. Yogi Berra and Frank Scott had started it. And you could go back to the 1920s with Red Grange and uh, his agent, C.C. Pyle, known as Cash and Carry Pyle, who was Red Grange's agent for all, for uh, not, lack of a better term, in 1925. So Palmer's winning all these tournaments as the popularity of the game is booming. And McCormick is combining his love of golf and business, and he recognizes the power of television. Arnie is lightning on TV. While Palmer is playing major tournaments, McCormick is negotiating major endorsement deals. In his first two years with McCormick, the endorsements grew from $6,000 to $500,000. Palmer won the Masters, played golf with presidents, pitched pens oil, Howard Cosell, there's a great outtake of Howard Cosell trying to do a radio show, and somebody plays a Pennzoil commercial where it's not supposed to go. And Howard says, I got Pennzoil in my ear. Pennzoil hurts rental cars in his spare time. Eventually, it would come to this Arnold Palmer, half and half, iced tea, lemonade, sugar sweetened mix with the uh, rainbow umbrella. Arnie is long gone but the iced tea lives on. Palmer's relationship winning the Augusta National and the television screen pushes in him into the stratosphere of American and global celebrity. Chicanian produced 38 consecutive masters from 1958 to 1996, but he knew with all the other innovations that he did for the TV screen in the 1950s, he had to focus on Arnie. Why? Because as Frank said, he absolutely fired up the screen. He had viewers. He had people interested. And these 
three forces, McCormick, Palmer, and Chicanian, come together to build golf into a global brand in the 1960s. In 1960, only four Americans made the field after mandatory qualifying, and only two of them made the cut at the Open in Scotland. Arnold Palmer, who had won the Masters in the U.S. Open that year, was attempting to match Ben Hogan's three for three for the 1953 season. He lost by a stroke, but what he did, and what Rune Arlich, Rune, get over here, as Howard Coso would have said, Rune Arlich, Rune Arlich was able to get ABC, or able to get the rights to the Open on ABC, part of uh, the wide world of sports, the uh, agony of defeat, thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, which actually launched Howard Crosell nationally. Uh, he lost by one stroke, but American golfers go to the event, and Rune Arlich gets it for ABC. With Palmer going over to the Open, and other Americans and people from other parts of the world, Rune, Rune Arlich, who would eventually head up NBC, ABC uh, News, uh, bring Monday Night Football to ABC in 1970, uh, came out of the Dumont Television Network. In 1962, he gets the rights. It's part of the wide world of sports package. ABC doesn't have very much. In fact, ABC is not even a full network at that point. But Rune is the fourth piece that they need, and they get Rune. And with that, golf takes off. There's Rune, ABC, 1976, Rune Arlich. Rune Arlich gets Harry Reasoner and Barbara Walters on the ABC World News Tonight. It was the first time a woman uh, was a permanent co-anchor of the evening news, and that's uh, Rune Arlich's uh, gift to TV and Nightline as well, uh, which initially in 1979 was supposed to be following uh, the day-to-day -day activities of the Iranian hostages, the American hostages held in uh, the American uh, embassy in Tehran. ABC, or the American Broadcasting Company, was a struggling TV network, little direction in 1960. He was brought in to write the ship, and uh, he brings in all sorts of go uh, global sports events into American households, including wide world of sports, the Olympics, and the Open. With Palmer and the Americans going to Scotland, all of a sudden, it's golf's uh, so-called, uh, it's, it's golf's go-to place, actually, and the so-called majors take place. The Masters, Augusta, Georgia, the U.S. Open, the PGA Championship. Players from the European Tour, along with those from Japan, are welcomed in America. All these people make golf an international game. Um, Palmer may have saved, Palmer and Arlich may have saved the Open in Britain uh, as a major golf tournament. There are the rivals, the last picture of the rivals, Jack Nicholas on the left, Arnie in the center, Gary Player on the right. These are the three guys on the golf course that transform golf. Gary Player, South African, joined the PGA Tour in 1957. Within two years, he had uh, begun to won. His first major, 1959, uh, the Open, uh, the first of three British Open titles he'd win. He won the PGA Championship twice, the Masters three times, he finally completed a career Grand Slam in 1965, winning the U.S. Open. The Golden Bear, Jack Nicholas, won 18 majors. His greatest success, the Masters, six-time winner of the tournament. By far a tournament record, his last major title, Augusta, 1986. Coincidentally, Palmer, Player, and Nicholas were all Mark, McQu Mark McCormick clients. Now, when the Buick Open was played in Harrison, we were at the Westchester Golf Course over in Harrison. Uh, I was covering, I was a young guy covering in the 1980s, and Fuzzy Zeller uh, and I got to talking one day. And Fuzzy said to me, did you ever hear of the talk? I said, what do you mean the talk? He said, oh, you don't know anything about the talk? I said, I never heard about the talk. He said, when you joined the tour, you got the talk. It was either Arnie or Jack Nicholas." And basically what they said, they looked at you and said, I'm making a good living here. You're going to do nothing to mess up my ability to make millions of dollars, which means you are going to play by our rules. Our rules, keep your nose clean. Don't cause any controversy. Don't mess with the brand. And Fuzzy said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that was the brand. Probably exists to this day. Arnie and Jack told you, don't mess with us. 
this is what we're, we got the golden goose here. You're not going to kill it. And Fuzzy never killed it. Nancy Lopez in the 1970s became the second greatest golfer ever at the time behind Babe. Uh, 1978, she won nine tournaments, including five consecutive. She appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated when it was a magazine that was a must-read magazine back then. She won the Vare Trophy for the lowest scoring average, LPGA Rookie of the Year, LPGA Player of the Year, and the Associated Press Female Athlete of the Year. Tiger Woods came around in the 1990s and carried golf in the 1990s up until about 2008. And I'm going to tell you a story about Tiger Woods and Arnold Palmer and how Tiger Woods was thrown off or threw himself off the Stanford University golf team. Now, remember I talked to you about the talk. They all got the talk. Uh, Tiger was going to college, Stanford University, and Arnold uh, knew that Tiger Woods was going to be a great golfer, and already decided, you know what, I think I'm going to give him the talk. So he calls Tiger at Stanford University and said, I'd like for you to come out to dinner with me. Little did Arnie realize that uh, it would be a violation of NCAA, National Collegiate Athletic Association rules, if he took Tiger Woods out and Tiger Woods didn't pay the $20 check that they had for dinner. It was only 20 bucks. What could that be? San Francisco area? I mean, over at Stanford University, Palo Alto, 20 bucks, but that's all it was, about 20 bucks. Uh, Arnold took Tiger out to dinner and the NCAA decides to snoop around to see if somebody bought Tiger Woods something illegally. You gotta remember, this is a uh, organization, Rick Majerus was the coach of uh, the University of Utah back in the 1980s, and he took one of his recruits out to McDonald's for a dinner, $4 dinner, and Utah got sanctioned because he took a kid out for a $4 dinner. This was a dinner between Arnie and uh, Tiger. So Tiger, knowing what was gonna happen with him, says, you know what? You know, the NCAA is coming in, they're having an inquiry to see whether anything, any wrongdoing happened. So he said, listen, no wrongdoing happened, but you know what? These guys are my friends on the golf team, and I'm not going to screw their college career up. I know what I'm going to do in my pro career. I'm not going to screw them up. They may never have a chance of glory, which would be an NCAA championship. So I'm quitting the team. I'm gone because I don't want to hurt the other people. I mean, this was a $20 dinner that Arnie gave to Tiger simply because he wanted to read the riot act to Tiger. This is how you act as a professional golfer. With that, Tiger Woods never finished Stanford University, but I get the feeling that in terms of a college degree, he probably didn't need it to make money. Woods had won uh, 80 official PGA tournaments, including 15 majors. 14 and one going into a final round of a major with at least a share of the lead. He wins the Masters in 2019. Um, it was his first come from behind win. He, along with Gene Sarazen, Harrison's own Gene Sarazen, Ben Hogan, Gary Player, and Jack Nicholas, they're one of five players, or he is one of five players, to have won all professional major championships in his career, known as the career Grand Slam, the youngest to do so. Oh, yeah, you can play golf on the moon. Just in case you don't realize that you can't play golf on the moon. Alan Shepard, February 1971. Alan Shepard was the first American into suborbital flight on uh, the first Mercury uh, spacecraft, which took off in uh, May of 1961. And then he was grounded by um, inner ear infection for years and years and years. It somehow cleared up, so they cleared him to go to the moon on Apollo 14. First mission after the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission, and he kind of sneaks a golf club on. On April, on February 6, 1971, Alan Shepard pulled out a makeshift six iron that he smuggled on board. The Apollo 14 hits two golf balls on the lunar surface, and he becomes the first and only, as far as we know, as far as we know, to play golf anywhere other than Earth. So Alan Shepard, uh, there is. The picture of him, man on the moon, playing golf, uh, getting an award. He played golf on, well, he hit a golf ball on the moon. Um, what's the future? Not that bright. Uh, yeah, golf in 2017, 
first time players, 2.6 million participants. Uh, in 2017, golf had a stable base of about 23.8 million golfers. Affordability has become an issue. Uh, 200 golf courses closed in 2017. With the COVID-19 illness going around, golf courses are reopening. We don't know what's going to happen in terms of, of profitability at golf courses. Uh, I know I've been reading that some golf courses around the New York City area are hurting right now. Uh, golf needs to get younger. They really need to get younger. They need to get big time stars again, like Tiger Woods. Uh, although Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson and, and Tom Brady and uh, Peyton Manning did well, uh, the highest ratings ever for that uh, uh, thing they did a couple Sundays ago. Uh, Americans who do watch golf tend to be much older, 50 to 64. The young demographics aren't good. Uh, the Mickelson versus Tiger started on pay-per-view, did well on pay-per-view, and has now moved over to uh, television that you don't necessarily pay for. So that is the future of golf. Uh, as I said, golf's roots, Westchester County, New York. Um, and uh, in September, if all things go well in September, um, and, and you're asking a lot for all things to go well in September. There will be the U.S. Open. Uh, the spread of the COVID virus has to be contained. Uh, golfers are going to have to prove they're able to go from place to place. Uh, there are some golfers who would come in, who they may have to be quarantined coming in for two weeks coming uh, and leaving wherever they go back to. They may have to be quarantined for two weeks as well. Uh, a lot of obstacles in the way but uh, they're gonna give it a go anyway. Um, so uh, I hope uh, you had fun uh, listening to a little bit about golf, a little bit about television production, and a little bit about the golden, uh, the Gilded Age and the women's livers. They were women's livers in the 1890s. Uh, any questions or any comments? Yes, everybody can unmute. Uh-oh. It's not working on my end to mute everyone. <laughs> it should be, but it's not. Questions, comments, anything you could add? David, as a TV guy, did you learn anything? No, it, this was incredibly educational. Uh, golf and women's lib, what an amazing combination. Did you get yeah, that? I, I mean, yeah, the, the, the wives, they wouldn't let the wives play. So, but not only that, I mean, not only that, not letting the wives play, they ended up freeing everybody on Sundays not to just stay home. I mean, they could go on and do other things on Sundays. Evan, I would, I would posit to you, I mean, that really started a social revolution in, Amer in North America. The idea that Sunday is just like any other day and supermarkets and pubs and you know, everything is open and you can get anything you want on Sunday as well. A, a group of wealthy women's golfers decided in some ways to hell with the idea of the holy, holy day in the week. And we'll, we'll say our prayers on the links. Anybody else? <laughs> get open up. Anybody have any golf stories? Any good golf stories? <laughs> Any, golf. Any stories? Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, being a lovely audience. I'm going to take a screenshot here of everybody. There we go. And uh, we have another one on uh, August third, right? August third. We're going to yes. you can you can promote what you're doing this summer because I have uh, what I'm doing is part of what you're doing with your book. Right. Well, we have, thank you. That's excellent. We yeah, are I mean, having, TV and radio. I know how to do a segue. Yes, you sure certainly do. Um, the library is having its adult summer reading program starting June 16th. We have a local best-selling author, Susie Armand, who will be our adult summer reading ambassador. And the theme for the summer is the 1939 World's Fair which took place in Queens in Flushing Meadows Park. And it was a momentous occasion. And the book that we're reading over the summer, We Came Here to Shine, is set in, 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 in the World's Fair. And it's also such an important time in history. So tying in sports, 
Yes, we'll have someone, Richard Sandomir, will be talking about uh, Pride of the Yankees, which was the movie based on the life of Lou Gehrig. But more importantly, we'll have Evan back August 3rd to talk about uh, the history of radio, which was so crucial in the 1930s and 40s. Yep. So we're tying mm -hmm. in all aspects of 1939 and 1930s. So we'll have dance lessons for all of your, uh, all of the health and fitness enthusiasts. We'll have a series with the Fred Astaire Dance Studio. We will have mm -hmm. the author uh, presenting a trivia night. We're preparing a, a panel discussion about women raising their voices. Again, a shout out to women and, mm -hmm. and, and, and how to move ahead. And you, you name it, we're thinking of it. And we hope you will all be able to join us. Topics for everyone, all ages, <laughs> all genders. And as you see, golf is not just for men, is not just for men, which is why when I chose my, one of my images to promote the talk, I made sure I had both a, a man and a woman visible. I'm just gonna say something for those of you who are coming to the uh, August 3rd talk. I'm gonna ask this, you got two months to look this up. Um, why? Why does kryptonite play such an important role in Superman's life? And how did that come about? I'm not gonna give you the answer now. I will on August 3rd, but uh, you know, you talk about uh, 1939. Um, uh, I do early days of radio and early days of TV talk. And the uh, first person that was ever on TV in the United States, April 30th, 1939 was Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, at the World's Fair, welcoming people to the World's Fair. And uh, uh, he, uh, he was there, and uh, I'll give you a quick story. I was in, on Long Island in November, and there was, uh, I give talks to senior residences, and a whole bunch of people uh, over the years, they're getting older now, uh, have told me about seeing TV for the first time at the World's Fair. And there was a guy uh, on, on the island in November, he was 93 years old. 92, 93, and he said, uh, I was doing some in the early days of TV, and he said, you know, I was on TV in 1939. I said, what? So yeah, I was on TV in 1939. So I was uh, 13 years old, and I walked into the World's Fair, and they had the pavilion of the future where the TV was, and he said, and we're all in a circle, and uh, we're getting closer to CTV, which was like that thing. In fact, it was literally this size, television. In fact, it was smaller than that. And uh, one of the guards said to uh, his mother and his father, uh, can we put him on TV? And they said, well, where are you taking him? He said, well, we're going to take him behind that curtain. And, and they just moved the curtain there so they could see the side of the TV. And uh, he said he was 13 years old and he was on TV. And uh, it was such a cool experience, except the thing was he never got to see what the TV really looked like because he was on TV and he lost his place online, so he never got to see what TV looked like. But his parents did, and I said, did they take a picture? He said, no, no camera, and obviously no tape in those days. But uh, it, was, uh, it, was quite, it was quite the thing for the people who were actually there. Now, all those people there now who remember are 91, 92, 93 years old. Uh, when I was doing that talk a few years ago, um, they were obviously younger and they remembered more. But uh, yeah, 1939, uh, no, no videotape. There was no videotape. I just got a uh, uh, in chat. No, we're not going to the videotape. But uh, a lot of people who I have spoken to, I've been doing these talks for more than two decades. We've talked about early days of TV. And a lot of people remember the 1939 World's Fair and how great it was and, and what a, a marvel it was at the time. And everybody says it was about TV, seeing TV. And that was the big thing from, from those people. But I'm sure the book has more than just the TV. Your I'm turn, sorry. Ivana. Yeah, my turn. I think, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. So we'll have to tune in August 3rd to hear yep. more. Anyway, I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank uh, Giovanna for uh, inviting me. We will see wow, you on pleasure. August 3rd, although my wife is going to see you on the other programs yes. that you run. 
which yeah. are very, very good. Make sure you tune into our other programs. And uh, David, I'll be speaking to you and everybody else. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we will see you uh, somewhere in the near future. Online, right? We'll Online. see you on the internet. Um, Evan, I'm going to call you tomorrow, Evan, okay? Okay, we'll talk to you then. Take see care you. then, everybody. All right.